So as the last lesson on the linear regression, I want to a little bit clarify this question about linearity of the, of the linear regression and how we could model also non-linearities. So in my experience, this is something that uh, often, often causes confusion and gets uh, perhaps too little attention in the uh, econometrics texts. So I have already briefly, briefly mentioned, but I want to still emphasize again that uh, the regression equation, the linear regression model, uh, it's linear in terms of the parameters. So linear in terms of the betas and the epsilon, but it doesn't necessarily have to be linear in terms of the uh, X and Y variables. So the explanatory variables can come in the, in the nonlinear form. So therefore this term linear regression might appear more restrictive than it actually is. So it's possible to do all kinds of uh, data transformations for our variables to model nonlinear relationships between X and Y. So this is of course, ultimately when what we are interested in nonlinearity is between these uh, exponential variables and X. So let me, let me give, um, give you some, some examples how those nonlinearities could, could be modeled. So consider the single exam, single regression case. So we have just a single X variable, but uh, nothing really prevents us to uh, extend it to a polynomial functional form and take not just the uh, X2, but we could also take X2 to power two, X2 to power three and so on. So I have in this example taken a K minus one or the polynomial function. So notice that there is still just a single X variable but we would have multiple coefficients that would uh, represent this higher order coefficients of the polynomial functional form. And uh, here is a diagram illustrating how the polynomial functional form might look like. So there is a horizontal axis would be X and the vertical axis would be Y. So the model can be highly nonlinear in terms of the X and Y variable, but it's still linear in parameters. We just have these multiple parameters for this uh, second and higher order coefficients of the model. In my view, this is something like a, a very often neglected possibility in, in, uh, in uh, that people often uh, restrict to the linear functional form, interpreting that it should be also linear in terms of the X variable, but that's not, uh, not indeed the case. Another thing, uh, another example I want to mention is this uh, uh, very widely used log linear functional form used in economics in many, many contexts. So originally it was introduced by American economists Cobb and Douglas in the uh, late 1920s. And um, in, in many, many uh, other contexts also nowadays it's, it's uh, used. Uh, so uh, if you think about this uh, functional form I have on the top part, it's in uh, original units. So if you have a uh, y equals uh, x2 to power beta 2, x3 to multiplied by x3 to power beta 3, multiplied by other, other x variables, and, and we have finally k variables, multiplied by exponent of a constant term beta 1, and multiplied by exponent, exponential function of uh, epsilon. Then if we take uh, natural logarithms of both sides of the equation, so then we would have a logarithm of y as the dependent variable, and uh, this, uh, this gives a very uh, convenient regression equation, which is actually linear in parameters. So then we would take logarithms of all, all variables. And um, notice two things. So one is that in the original equation, when we, when we take this uh, model, express these uh, variables in original units rather than logarithms, then uh, the error term epsilon uh, enters this uh, this model in a multiplicative fashion. So uh, um, in 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 this kind of setting, then then uh, notice that uh, that uh, this uh, epsilon has different effect depending on how large these x variables are. So this kind of uh, multiplicative formulation is uh, often used, for example, when there is uh, heteroscelasticity with respect to the size. So if the variance of the of the y variable increases with the size. Then, then this kind of formulation can take uh, take into account that. So we will talk about heteroscedasticity later on uh, during the course. Another thing I want to want to emphasize is this uh, interpretation of the beta parameters. 
So um, especially the slope coefficients for, for this x2, x3, and so on. So now when the, when the model is uh, expressed in the logarithmic form, so we take both logs of, from both sides of the equation, then these uh, slope coefficients beta have uh, an attractive, attractive interpretation as elasticity. So in the case of the production function, it would be output elasticity, and uh, meaning that, uh, that uh, if uh, this x variable increases by 1%, then uh, uh, y variable increases by, by uh, beta percent. So beta increases kind of percentage increase in y variable as a result of 1% increase in beta. So it's proportionate increase rather than in the additive uh, linear equation we had this kind of, uh, kind of uh, let's say, euros per square meter, but now it is like a percentage increase corresponding to the 1% increase in, in X. And in many contexts, this kind of elasticity interpretation is actually very convenient. And uh, it's uh, this kind of elasticity interpretation ap ap applies whenever we, we use this kind of double log formulation where we take logs from both sides of the equation. So this is, uh, for good reasons, uh, it's, it's very commonly used in economics, this kind of... Uh, double log uh, formulation. But what if the true functional form is not known? Of course, even, even in a case of the production function, there's not really any reason why, why the production uh, should follow this particular functional form. It is convenient, but, uh, but uh, is it really uh, following the reality? So if you go beyond the linear regression, then of course there exists also so-called nonlinear regression so if you know the, the true functional form that you, that, uh, you believe that uh, corresponds to the whatever reality you want to model, then, then it is possible to, to also uh, estimate uh, some nonlinear, which is nonlinear in terms of parameters beta. However, very often I would say in econometrics, uh, the fact is that uh, the true functional form of the theoretical model is unknown. That, uh, Whatever we use, linear or log linear or, or polynomial, it's more or less an approximation that, uh, that we want to just give some kind of uh, flexibility, but, but actually we have no idea what is the underlying true functional form. So the, in this kind of setting, um, there's little benefit of modeling some kind of nonlinear functional form in terms of parameters, because we can, we can equally well then use some, some uh, approximation that is linear in parameters. But uh, so this goes now a little bit beyond the scope of the current course, but, uh, but uh, I want to give you a little bit of uh, flavor of uh, modern econometrics that, uh, that what, what can we do if we go beyond the linear regression. And in fact, uh, we can also utilize a lot of insights from the linear regression. And um, this is actually something that I have, uh, I have done also work in my research, uh, uh, research that, uh, that uh, how to estimate uh, regression function when the true functional form is not known. And there is this area of uh, non-parametric regression, which is, uh, I would say, growing and becoming more and more widely used nowadays with the, with the better data and better computational resources and better software. So we do not need to actually specify this uh, functional form necessarily beforehand. And there are two basic approaches to dealing with this kind of estimation of an unspecified uh, regression function. One is local averaging, another one is uh, shape-constrained regression. And both, both cases, actually, we can also, also build upon the linear regression that we will study in this, in this course. So, for example, in local averaging, very common approach is to use so-called local linear regression or local linear kernel, where we, in fact, we, we in some sense, we fit the linear regression, but uh, we restrict it to, to certain, certain local, local environment. Shape-constrained regression, it's also, also like, for example, convex regression is an area where I have done some uh, considerable amount of work. So there, for example, in one of my most influential works, I, I proved formally that the optimal solution to the convex regression estimator is actually to fit a piecewise linear functional form. And piecewise linear 
functional form can be can be freely uh, sourced from the data so that uh, we don't need to specify in advance how many pieces and where these uh, uh, vertices will be located but uh, but uh, even if we don't know what is the func functional form if it is satisfies convexity or concavity then uh, uh, it's useful to fit a piecewise linear functional form and to little bit illustrate uh, your these uh, non-parametric regression techniques. I took uh, took an illustrative uh, two illustrative figures from a recent paper by Yagi et al., where we where we uh, fit uh, production functions of the wood industry in Chile by both local linear kernel and uh, SCKLS, which is called shape constraints kernel least squares uh, that we proposed in the paper. So the local linear regression is illustrated on the left hand side figure so there are two inputs uh, labor and capital and then we have value added as a, as the output so it's a three dimensional diagram and um, as as this figure illustrated even if it is local linear so there's a very much flexibility because it is it is the localized uh, estimator in some sense you can think about it any anyway as this kind of smooth uh, uh, smooth function and uh, and it uh, can take basically any shape. So that, that's the advantage of the non-parametric regression that uh, uh, as a researcher, analyst or whatever, uh, you don't need to specify in advance what kind of, kind of uh, shape this uh, function can take. Like in the linear regression, it would be just a straight line. If you have a polynomial functional form fitted by linear regression, it would have to be polynomial. But, uh, but uh, non-parametric regression then can allow the data speak for themselves. However, sometimes you want to actually impose some kind of structure to the to the to this uh, form. So for example, on the on the right hand side figure, uh, we we consider this kind of concave. Uh, so if what if we want to have a production function that that is concave. So simply imposing this kind of straight uh, shape constraints can make this uh, make this uh, regression function look much more smoother. And if you, for example, look at some kind of uh, substitution properties between capital and labor, or we look at uh, returns to scale or elasticities of scale, it can be very useful to, to impose some additional structure beyond this uh, uh, local linear regression. So in that, that particular paper that I cited here, then we then we develop this kind of in some sense a compromise between shape constraint and uh, and uh, and local averaging techniques. But uh, as I mentioned, this this goes a little bit uh, beyond the current uh, course. Uh, uh, I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what uh, what uh, non-parametric regression can look like uh, and uh, highlight the fact that actually we are still building up building quite heavily on the basis of the linear regression. So finally, I want to also then, then uh, briefly discuss this uh, issue of uh, model specification that, uh, that uh, when, we, when we consider later the um, statistical properties, for example, we always assume that the model is correctly specified. But how to, how to think about this? How do we know that, uh, that is, um, is my model correctly specified or not? And uh, it's perhaps useful to, to reflect it from a perspective of uh, famous statistician George Box, who, who famously noted that uh, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. That uh, in some sense, uh, this, uh, this uh, statement uh, highlights the fact that uh, by doing some econometric modeling, we always, of course, have to simplify the reality. So all, all models are just uh, just models of the reality, not the reality itself. And then, of course, the question is that to what uh, to what extent we need to simplify, and to what extent simplification is uh, is required or useful. And uh, even if all models are wrong, then it doesn't mean that all models are equally wrong. That uh, that uh, some models are useful, and then then we can also claim that some models are more useful than others, and then. Later, when we look at these uh, statistical properties, we want to be able to also compare different models. That, for example, we can consider how biased the model is, and some models are more biased than others. Some models are more efficient than others. 
And uh, there is this uh, uh, philosophical principle called Occam's razor, that uh, if we have uh, two models that are, have equally good uh, explanatory power, then uh, we should prefer the simpler model. That, uh, that in some sense we want to simplify as much as possible, but not too much. So in some sense we are always balancing on this Occam's razor. Simple enough, but not too simple. Okay, so what, which model is correct? It's, it's, uh, it's uh, in some sense, we don't use this kind of terminology in econometrics or statistics that, uh, that, that we cannot say that uh, one model is correct or the other. We basically then compare their properties based on usefulness. And particularly we will look at that, uh, okay, what kind of assumptions we need to make in order to believe in the model? What kind of assumptions are believable? And some, some models require less restrictive assumptions than others. So that's all for now. I will next then move to the, to the third theme of the course, uh, which uh, considers statistical properties. And after that, we proceed to the statistical inferences. So, so as the next theme, indeed, we want to look at this performances of alternative estimators and starting from the classic OLS estimator, introducing its properties.